everybody, and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Sinead DeFries, and this is The Daily Show, where we bring you the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us this morning is your Collider Movie Talk crew. First up, senior producer, John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie-related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Headquarters here in Burbank, California, and I'm so excited every day when we get to work with Ashley DeFries. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so close. So close. Oh. Oh, you got it. one of her two Again. names correct. All right. Well, whatever. Also here, writer-director John Schnepp. Yeah, get it right. It's Yanade <laughs> de Vries. <laughs> hey, what's up, everybody? I'm Jan Schnepp. <laughs> <laughs> and also here, Mark Ellis. My name is Mark Edward Ellis, Jr. <laughs> Second, I'm a junior. Get that Y in there. All right, so as many of you know, the next installment of the Marvel Cinematic Universe is Captain America Civil War, which hits theaters next year. Now, according to Lady Sif actress Jamie Alexander, we learn that Civil War will also serve to somewhat set up and allude to the next Thor film, Thor Ragnarok, hitting theaters on July 28, 2017. Alexander also revealed that Lady Sif will play a pivotal role in the new Thor film, saying the following. Marvel, I think on purpose, they don't tell me certain things because they know I'll be like, so here's what's going to happen. But I do know I will be in Thor 3 and that Sif will have a very pivotal part in that movie. I just can't tell you what because I'll get shot. <laughs> Schnepp, what do you think of Alexander's comments? I love it. I love that she's, uh, you know, we all hope that she's going to be in Thor 3. And in fact, we probably were betting on it that she's going to be in Thor 3. But that she's going to be in uh, Civil War is great. I, I can't wait for uh, Ragnarok. I'm a big Beta Ray Bill fan. I know that'll probably never happen. The guy with the weird horse head. I but, don't don't count it out. Hey, I'm just saying, you know, I would like that to happen. But yeah, I'm excited to hear that she's going to be in Civil War with the other 75 Marvel characters <laughs> that are all going to have like some segmented scene in there. With Ant-Man, he's going to be in there. Well, that, well, let's be clear here. I don't know that she came out and said she's going to be in Civil War. I don't, I don't know that she has. Like I, At least in the comments that I've read, she hasn't come out and said she's in Civil War. They have said that Civil War, though is going to have a lot of hints and, and do a little bit of set, set up for Thor Ragnarok, mm -hmm. right? But whether she's in it or not, I'm not really sure. When she was on the panel with us, Jamie was on the panel with us at Stanley's Kamikaze right. about a year or so ago. Yeah. And remember backstage, we were all talking. But I think she said actually on the panel that there is more Sif in more Thor films coming. And yeah. she told us that like a year or so ago. Yeah. So it's not surprising, but it is exciting because I actually think that Lady Sif is one of those underused characters in the civil in in the uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe right now because she's one of these characters that I think was meant to be a side afterthought character, but she plays out so well when she's on screen that I think it almost kind of behooves them to utilize the mm -hmm. character more. And I just love the way Jamie plays her. So for me, this is terrific news. I'm excited about it, Mark. Jamie Alexander was on a panel with you guys at Kamikaze. Where yeah. the hell was I? Where was my invitation? <laughs> you weren't part of the team That's yet. That's something I want to participate in. <laughs> this is great news. The Civil War is going to set up Thor Ragnarok because it means we might get another Thor tub time machine <laughs> random <laughs> sequence <laughs> like we got in Avengers Age of Ultron, but it'll be explained more. So I like that these movies tie into each other so well, and they are some ancillary characters so far in Thor and and Thor 2, the dark world, where you're, you're interested in what exactly they have going on behind the scenes back up on Asgard. So I think that we will see her in Civil War. I don't think it's going to be a big part. Nobody's going to have a really big part in Civil War. It's just a bunch <laughs> of people hanging out at a bar and a fire marshal's like, there's too many people in here. We got to get some of you guys out. The Hulk just tears the bar apart. <laughs> But I, I like that it's going to be a setup for Thor Ragnarok. It means that they're going to continue all these stories together. So every movie that's coming out from Marvel Kids is going to feel a little bit like an Avengers movie because it's not just about the character on the marquee. It's yeah. about all these characters tying in eventually until we get to Infinity War. I'm glad you brought up the whole hot tub time machine scene because mm -hmm. everybody knows I re actually really enjoyed Age of Ultron. Um, oh, yeah. I, I liked it a lot. But one of the big problems that I had with the film was that whole hot tub time machine scene where he, he why were you taking up screen time? I said, wait, but I'm going to go and get into this magical bath and hopefully the spirits will give me a vision. It's like it was so inconsistent with everything they've done so far with Thor and with everything else. And at the same time, he's bringing along. Uh, uh, what's his name's dad? He's bringing him along, the scientist. Stellan Skarsgård. Yeah, yeah Stellan Skarsgård. Naked man. He, yeah. Naked man who loves to scream and, <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. He brings him along, who's supposed to, in the movies, like be this man of science. And he's going to explain to Thor how he can receive a vision from the water spirits. Like that just, and now they're saying that's all a big illusion to Thor Ragnarok. That's all a big setup. Well, it just kind of highlights for me, I didn't pay to come see 
Age of Ultron to watch you set up Thor Ragnarok. I came to watch the Age of Ultron, uh, you know, but and I thought it was a wasted scene. I'll say this about that scene. I think it was setting up the Infinity Stones. It was less about Ragnarok and more about the stones. You think and so? What, yeah, because that's that's what he saw in that vision was like all the different stones coming together. And that, that scene was also truncated. I would have rather that scene been longer and they cut out almost all of Hawkeye's like stupid farm family stuff. Yeah, but of course, I like no, the farm scene. I, I like anyway. the farm scene. You do need to know how Thor bays and gets that luxurious hair. You can see a bottle of Pantene <laughs> there in the corner. <laughs> what, what concerns me about these comments in Civil War is that you hope that Marvel doesn't over isn't isn't too overbearing on the Russo brothers and saying, oh, you guys need to have this scene in there because we need to set this up. Because that was the complaint that Joss Whedon had about making Avengers Age of Ultron is that Marvel was like, no, you got to have that scene in there. So I hope that they're not too like, no, you got to do this, you got to do this. I want the Russo brothers to be able to make the movie that they want to make because I think that they're smart enough to be able to set up future films without having Marvel say, no, you got to do this too. Well, they're also doing the Infinity Wars. So I think they're all going to be like it's all going to be they're a setting up their transition. own story yeah, yeah it's not like they have to set it up to give it to somebody else and be like and then we'll do this so i think it'll be smooth all right what's next the brand new trailer for the upcoming james bond film specter has hit the web a cryptic message from the past sends james bond on a rogue mission to mexico city and eventually rome where he meets lucia ciara played by monica bellucci the beautiful mm. and forbidden widow of an infamous criminal <laughs> Bond infiltrates a secret meeting and uncovers the existence of the sinister organization known as Spectre. The new film opens in theaters on November 6th. John, what did you think of the new Spectre trailer? I don't know what everybody says, Monica Bellucci. I just, on my, you made a weird a noise. Like, you mm. mm. sound like a gremlin. I love yeah, Monica like a Bellucci. Or gremlin or at the Olive Garden. Um, <laughs> da 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 da. Boring. I didn't like the trailer. What? Which is so weird. I know. I, it's so oh. weird. I was, I was getting tweets because the trailer dropped at midnight. Mm hmm. And I was in bed by that time. So I woke up to a whole bunch of tweets saying, have you seen the new Bond trailer, the Spectre trailer? It's awesome. It's amazing. And everybody loved it. And maybe that was setting me up for disappointment. Maybe I got my expectations. Because I sat down and I watched the trailer. And eh, I, it, it looked like any cookie cutter, you know, action movie trailer to me. Look, the movie is going to be amazing. I cannot wait for it. I'm incredibly stoked for it. But quite frankly, I like the first trailer better than this one. I this one didn't really give me anything. Although hearing, you know, the Jew Hunter's voice talking as mm -hmm. menacingly as he does and all that kind of stuff, that that was pretty cool. But other than that, I felt like a lot of the trailer was wasted to me. Wasn't that excited? But we're just talking about the trailer. The movie's going to be killer. I, it just didn't work for me, Mark. Oh, this definitely worked for me. I've had three martinis today to celebrate the new Spectre trailer because this feels like a James Bond movie. You said it felt like an action movie. It feels like James Bond, man. Not only do you get all these cool vehicles that are fighting each other, you get that scene with Q, and he's showing you all the gadgets. You get James Bond dressed up. You get the Bond girls, and you get the Bond villain. Christoph Waltz, you just saw the shadow of him in the teaser trailer, yeah. which I thought was a great setup. And now this film is is being sold so well to the public because this is the first trailer that most people around the world are going to watch and be like, oh, sweet, there's a new James Bond movie coming out and it looks action-packed. It doesn't look like it's James Bond going through some other personal, weird, spiritual journey, which is fine setup, but now we get the real James Bond action movie we've wanted since Casino Royale hit. You know, I will say, you raise a good point. That one shot, though, when Christoph Waltz's face was still in the shadow, Bond's mm -hmm. up in the you know art gallery up there and his face turns out of the shadow into the light, that was actually mm -hmm. a pretty cool shot. I got to give it that. I thought it was Werner Herzog for a little bit, but <laughs> I absolutely love this trailer. And you're right. To me, it's like, I didn't like the first trailer for mm. myself. I thought the first trailer was like reminiscent of like, what is it? Skyfall two. He's going to like go find his cousin or something. It was like, he's all related. It was boring. It was all slow shots. I absolutely hated the first Jason trailer. Bourne's his cousin. It, it was <laughs> a Jason, Jason Boring's cousin. It was like, I didn't like the first trailer. This trailer, I agree with you, Mark. It felt to me like a James Bond trailer. They had all those elements, even a train scene with him fighting like an odd job type dude played by uh, Batista. Dave Batista. Mm -hmm. All that stuff just reminded me of like all the old classic Bond stuff. And I liked the way they peppered him through like, I've been there the whole time, like <laughs> showing all the scenes that just everything that screwed Bond up, I've been a part of. So it's it's definitely a great way to, it could be Daniel Craig's last movie. We know it's Sam Mendes' last movie. So I think they're I trying think to- I think Craig has one more film on his I think Craig's under contract this. for oh, okay. one more, but yeah. I like that they set up that this is Daniel Craig as Bond. This isn't your yeah. Sean Connery Bond. This is the Bond that's going to be a little more like, I don't really care what the man tells me to do. Yeah. I'm going to go to Mexico City and go Taking on this crazy mission. Yeah. yeah, it's cool. <laughs> yeah, it definitely felt like a Bond film. So I'm excited. This, this is the first Spectre trailer for me, at least, that made me feel like I can't wait to see this film. So All right, I'm going to have to watch this again. Monica Bellucci's in it. There's oh, worse things mm. to spend two minutes 
good song. Mm. All right. All right, folks, we reached out part of the show for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of her, Sinead's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. And those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So, Sinead, what do we got? Deadline is reporting that Sony Pictures has just won a bidding war for the rights to a story pitch for an emoji movie. Yep, we're not kidding, an emoji movie. According to the report, several studios were interested in acquiring the detailed pitch, co-written by Eric Siegel, known for TBS's Men at Work, and Anthony Leondis, who will also direct the film. Leondis also directed the upcoming animated film, BOO, Bureau of Otherworldly Operations. Mark, do you buy or sell the idea of an animated emoji movie? Sinead, here's what I think about this movie. <laughs> I'm excited about this and I'll tell you why what? because of the Lego movie because the Lego movie oh. proved you can make toys and have a new funny spin on it this movie is not going to take itself seriously it's going to make fun of the fact that we all use emojis I used to hate emojis and then I got a girlfriend that's the only way we communicate now is through <laughs> emojis it's so much easier than getting in a fight either text her the kiss emoji or the poo emoji and she knows exactly how I feel this movie's going to do the same thing they're going to have fun with this content I hope I am an early optimist of the emoji film. I don't know what is more surprising, that there is an emoji movie coming or that there was a bidding war amongst the studios <laughs> to get the emoji movie. But you raise an excellent point. I talked seven degrees of crap about the concept of a Lego movie. I thought, that is so stupid. This is dumb. This is never going to work. One of my favorite movies <laughs> of the year. And I am completely retired from the crapping on or poo-pooing <laughs> the idea of what, how much a Lego movie can accomplish. And maybe that's the same scenario here. Look, there is something to be said. If this pitch that these guys put together was so good that you had several studios lining up to try to get the rights for it, maybe there's something there to it. So at first I'm like, this is so ridiculous. And then you look at what's going on behind the scenes that... Maybe there's something worthwhile here. I don't know. Schnapp, how do you see it? What is that symbol where it's like red and frowny face with horns? Yeah, That's the devil face. It. It's so dumb. <laughs> it's so ridiculously stupid. It shows you oh, the well, pathetic. I'm sorry. I buy. Uh, I t totally sell this. It shows you the pathetic nature of Hollywood, like a bidding war on a bunch of stupid symbols. I don't even know what to say. But How do you, you begin? Like shapes. I, I love shapes. You're good at coloring I'm and stuff. Too. I'm waiting for the Tetris movie. Where's that, Hollywood, you losers? Um, well, why don't you make a real movie like Tetris instead of a bunch of dumb shapes and symbols with faces on it? It doesn't have to have a face. It can mean something. It could be a square. It could be a rectangle. It could, it could be, be an L shape. A block. And then when yeah. that long one comes right. in, you got to flip it and spin it. It's a whole story. Get on it. Write that script. But honestly, you sound... Exactly like me. I know with the Lego talking thing. about the Lego. No, I'm, thing I'm having a little like fun with it because it's so dumb. <laughs> it's it's dumb. so and pathetic and stupid that we're talking about it. I'm sure I'll see it. It was like I cried when Smiley Face Lego melted. <laughs> it's gonna be so pathetically stupid. It's so homogenized. It's like the shape of the Earth. It's round. And everyone can see it. I want to swear. Right now. <laughs> so let me just... throw this idea, though. Well, let All me right. try to pitch this in the frame of Inside Out. Because Please Inside do. Out has five emotions. And those emotions, emotions. anger and joy, and it's like th th those should be one-note characters, but they managed to make joy three-dimensional. So the character sadness. of joy could feel sadness, and the character of sadness could feel happiness. And so if you take an emoji that is just one picture, like the kissy one, it's not always going to be kissy. It's going to go through some heartbreak. And I can't even believe we're having this conversation. Where's my Monopoly movie, liars? That is coming. That's coming. Hold on. All, All right. right. Text you some emojis. What's next? <laughs> Another new trailer has hit the web, and this one, it's for the upcoming Pixar film, The Good Dinosaur. Pixar Animation Studios takes you on an epic journey into the world of dinosaurs, where an apatosaurus named Arlo makes an unlikely human friend. While traveling through a harsh and mysterious landscape, Arlo learns the power of confronting his fears and discovers what he is truly capable of. The Good Dinosaur opens in theaters on November 25th. Schnip. Schnap. Do you buy <laughs> Schnip. Schnip. Just call me Snap. That's what everybody does. Schnap. Um, do you buy or sell the trailer for The Good Dinosaur? Well, you need, I'll tell you this. <laughs> I buy it because I, you know, look, it's a Pixar film. You get sucked into it. I almost wanted to start crying watching this trailer. It's a it's going to be uh, hopefully not a lot of uh, talking. It'll be a really cool emotional scenes with a dinosaur and his pet human kind of like hanging out and doing a whole bunch of cool stuff, avoiding Tyrannosaurus Rexes, sliding on ice. You know, it's going to be it's going to be fun. I buy it. 
I know there was a lot of trouble with this. You know, we've read through the trades oh, like re-shots, directors man. got fired, rehired, refired, scripts changed, everything. You know, the story process that Pixar is famous for doing, they had to re- redo their entire story process. But ultimately, when they release a film, it proves its point because it's usually really incredibly good. So I'm looking forward to this. I, I buy this huge. I can't believe how much I like this trailer. Like, this is the one Pixar film to me. It's like, eh. I don't know if I'm so much because I'm a huge Pixar fan, but whatever. And I wasn't very big on the first trailer, that little teaser with right. the sh- first showing. Everybody else seemed to like it, but I'm like, meh. I got, I felt emotional. Mm-hmm. This trailer is a freaking work of art. Like everything from the characters suddenly, weirdly, this oddly, simply animated dinosaur, I feel emotionally attached to, mm-hmm. and then everything from the 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 choice of music. And it was perfect as the fireflies start to fly. I felt totally emotionally invested in it. I I went from being agnostic about this film to totally, you know, totally extremist now. Now it is your religion. I'm a religious extremist about this movie. I cannot wait to see it. You know, every time those Northern California hippies at Pixar have another movie coming out, I'm like, okay, let's see what they do this time. And every time they wow me with some new way to animate stuff, this this animation looks forward thinking. It looks even more impressive than Inside Out did. And I didn't think they could do that. The fact that it's Mm. a dinosaur and a human hanging out together and that they both look so damn cuddly. Every other dinosaur in here looks so scary and menacing. And then you have Arlo, and he's just walking around, and it's like it looks like something out of the Flintstones that every kid is yes. going to be rooting for because he's clearly the underdog. I don't care what a dinosaur he's going against; he's going to be the underdog. And you're right, John. This is going to make you cry. Inside Out didn't really give me the feels as much as I thought it would. Being a movie based on emotions, this is going to go back to that Up model, to that Bambi model, to that Dumbo model. It is there to make grown men weep. And it's probably going to do that. I'm going to text Schnapp the cry emoji as soon as I see this. Wait, movie. you didn't get a little like emotional at the hug scene? Yeah, yeah but I'm really I'm the kinda, hug. I'm dead oh. inside. <laughs> All right, Sinead, what's next? In late 2014, we learned that director Sean Levy had left the upcoming Warner Brothers project, Minecraft. Things have been quiet on the Minecraft front ever since then, until now. According to an announcement by the studio, the film has a new director. It's always sunny in Philadelphia creator, writer, and star Rob McElhenney, right? (laughs) Will direct. There is currently no release date set for the film. John, do you buy or sell the idea of a Minecraft film now with Rob McElhenney directing? You know what? I, this was gone from a sell to a buy. This guy is incredibly sharp. His humor is incredibly fast. I love the way he paces things out too when he directs episodes as well. I I just think this guy can take a concept like this, which held no appeal to me, and I think he can bring something interesting to it, much like the way Lord and Miller, going back to the Lego movie, mm-hmm. brought something to, to the Lego universe and suddenly made it enjoyable. I think he can do the same thing even on something as stupid as Minecraft. So for me, it's a buy. Something that's also very addicting, like Minecraft, too. Mm. And you're going to have to have a sense of humor in there. And I don't think there's a sharper sense of humor television series that's come out in the last 10 years than It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. So the fact that this guy is going to be championing this movie and he's the one taking care of it, I have total faith in what this is. You tell me a Minecraft movie is coming out, and I would rather see a Tetris movie. I might have, <laughs> but rather see him do a Tetris movie. But now, all of a sudden, I'm like this could work. It's nothing that I'm getting jacked for just yet, but I think it's got a chance to work really well. I'm buying it just because his name reminds me of Mecca Lecca High, Mecca Heine Ho. He always play out. Yeah, so I'm just buying it just for that reason, just, you know, because I don't even know what Minecraft is, really. <laughs> it's a bunch of kids running around with, like, a pixelated sword. I always thought it was, like, tie into pixels. Once you start like, playing it, no, you I know. will go I'm just, down a I'm deep just kidding. That's what hole. they all tell me. The other yeah. time, if you actually start playing, I've never played Minecraft. Yeah, you're going to build your does. own. Like I've got pages of stuff that I've built for Minecraft. It's like, all right, relax. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, folks, we've reached that part for a new segment on our show. What used to be another show of ours, Rewind, brought to you by the good folks, our friends over at AMC Theaters. In Rewind, we take a look at some of the movies that opened 10 years ago today and 20 years ago today, or at least this week. And I also like to affectionately refer to it as the feeling old segment. All right, first of all, <laughs> on to their 10-year anniversaries. Before Yanaid was born. Before Yanaid was born, before her three children were born. Going back 10 years, Where's celebrating Pepe? their 10th anniversary this week week bad news bears the devil's rejects hustle and flow and michael bay's the island and celebrating its 20th anniversary this week this one hits clueless clueless turns 20 years old this week along with free willy to snap what stands out to you on this list you know bad news bears devil's rejects hustle and flow the island 
So the bad news bears is the was the remake yes. that came out. So that stands out as like I don't want to see that remake. And even ten years later, I still don't want to see you know it. What? It wasn't as bad as you might think. It, it doesn't at all live up to the original. I know, but I for me that original with Walter Matthau is that's so it. So I don't want. I don't. I love Billy Bob Thornton. I love him in Bad Santa. I don't care to see him in Bad News Bears. You know what Electric Boogaloo or whatever it was called. So, <laughs> but uh, yes, yeah, what stands out to me is definitely the Devil's Rejects. That's a super freaky, weird Rob Zombie film. I like Rob Zombie's films. They, you know, they took a little time to get into for me at least. Um, but I really liked his take on Halloween, especially how the weird director's cut. So if you haven't checked out any of his stuff, what's the one that the last one that just came out? Uh, the name of it always. Escapes oh, me. we had him in studio. Yeah, well, to talk to us about it, and I, I can't remember the name of the movie. The one that just came out. The last one with year. the girl who dis discovers she's a witch and comes yeah. from long lines of witches. I cannot remember. Uh, I'm going to go with the witch. <laughs> For, it was I get pretty sure yeah. it was not the yeah. Salem something Salem yeah, the, was in there uh, the Salem which is a Salem uh. no no it wasn't which is a Salem anyway Mark what are, what have all these films emojis like of Salem it's just a frowny face <laughs> um Free Willy 2 is actually what stands out to me because you can't make a fun whale movie anymore unless it's something like Blackfish where or, or something like that's a documentary about how sad it is that we have whales in captivity Free Willy <laughs> 2 was back in the day when you could have a whale starting in captivity and then it could free itself the first Free Willy is the only one I saw, though. When the when the whale jumps out and frees its head, and it's in the air for like 30 Skimming. seconds. It's like Jordan just doing that free throw dunk. I don't know what happens at the end of Free Willy 2. I imagine it's a happy ending, too. Clueless, on the other hand, is a film that I was so excited for because I love Alicia Silverstone, particularly at that time in my life. I was a huge fan of the Aerosmith video she was in, and I'm like, can she carry her own movie? You're damn right she can. Alicia Silverstone, come back. We miss you. I think Aww. I think Free Willy 2 ended when it runs into a bunch of Japanese whalers. That does I'm not, not happen, sure. John. I cannot that remember. It's called happen. Lords of Salem, I just remembered Lords it. of Salem, Thank Super you. freaky, Rosemary's Baby meets uh, some other Kubrick nightmare. You should see that film. Um, It'll give you nightmares. The Island stands out to me because that was the first movie I remember that I was like, I, I was doing the movie blog already, and I was so conflicted about it. I was like, there were so many good concepts in there right. and yet executed so badly. So it was, I wasn't quite sure how to come out on that. But to me, it's it's clueless. That movie mm -hmm. is like still today culturally very relevant. People love that film. And what really freaks me out was Paul Rudd, because I think Anne was watching Clueless again like two weeks ago. Paul Rudd, I think, has aged four days <laughs> between Clueless and Ant-Man. That dude has not, like, he's drinking, you know, sheep blood or something. The dude is, it's freaky. He has not aged a day since that thing. So it's kind of weird to see at that point, too. So those are the ones that stand out to us. We'll be back again next week for the next little installment of Rewind. All right, folks, we've reached that part of the show now for Mailbag. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, you can email us anytime at collidervideo <clears throat> at gmail.com. Send on in your questions. Maybe you'll see it on Movie Talk. Maybe you'll see it on our weekend mailbag shows. But for now, Sinead, what's in the mailbag? Charles writes, I'm just as much excited as everyone else about the upcoming Deadpool movie, especially after watching, oops, the leaked San Diego Diego Comic Con <gasps> teaser, but it got me thinking. Even though I really enjoyed Ryan Reynolds' version of Green Lantern by the power of Grayskull, his quirky quips <laughs> and overall demeanor doesn't seem like quite the right fit for the more grounded DC cinematic universe. So I guess my question is, would you rather have had a great Green Lantern movie, thus securing Ryan Reynolds in the future DCC? DCCU, or are you glad it failed so we can get a potentially awesome redemption of the Merc with a Mouth? Look, I, I've said this before too. Green Lantern was a disappointment. I didn't hate it as much as much as much as a lot of people did. I thought there were some redeeming qualities about it, and one of the redeeming qualities I thought was Ryan Reynolds as Hal Jordan. I thought he was a great Hal Jordan. And one of the things that I think people fail to recognize in the film is that there is an evolution in the character throughout that movie, where he is very loose and you know cracking a lot of jokes from the beginning. As he starts to embrace the levity of and, and the weight of you know, his new responsibility and power and what's really coming and that the world is a threat. You see him change to the end of it that he's kind of a different guy than he was at the beginning. And I thought that was a great starting point for Hal Jordan. Also, I think there's a misconception that just because it hasn't happened yet means it can't ever happen. Who's to say he we could he couldn't have played both? Who's to say he could have been because he was Green Lantern and he was already Deadpool in the X Men universe at the same time? So there's nothing saying that it couldn't have gone on. It would have been difficult. I'm sure there would have been contractual issues, but it was happening already. So it wasn't a one or the other. But if I had to choose, would I rather see Ryan Reynolds playing a successful Green Lantern or a successful Deadpool? This dude was born to play Deadpool. 
I mean, he was born to play Deadpool, so I would vote for Deadpool. Schnapp, what about you? Yeah, I agree. He's born to play Deadpool. Ever since he was in Blade Trinity, I mean, playing Two Hannibal. guys in the pizza shack. Yeah, all of the all of, yeah. There's got to be one of those episodes What's where that? he's got a sword. <laughs> What's the one where he's like uh, playing a waiter? It's called Waiting, I think. Waiting. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, he's really funny. He's quick-witted. He's Deadpool. He's not Green Lantern. And he did a good job in Green Lantern, but then he had to fight a poo cloud at the end of the movie. <laughs> before, before that, he was fighting a guy with a giant head screaming like I was in a, watching a David Lynch film. I didn't know what that film was. It's, it's like one of those, like, the tone of that movie is crazy. You know, if you haven't seen Green Lantern, don't. Um, is what I can say. <laughs> Save yourself some time. Maybe watch a clip on YouTube and watch the poo cloud scene. But uh, no, Ryan Reynolds was great in it. But that's that doesn't you know. There's actors who are all who are great in horrible films. Yeah. So that doesn't make it worth seeing. So I'm glad that they're going to replace him with Chris Pine, and I'm sure he's glad because it, he, they don't want to keep that weird like striated energy suit muscle thing that he was wearing. Yeah. Super weird. He's like he's always commenting about eh, Deadpool. At least I get to wear a costume. I don't have to be replaced by some strange half naked CG muscle. Like flippy armature suit. I don't even know what you call that thing. I I, I don't think Chris think, Pine is actually the no. No, I don't think they've. I think there are rumors oh, okay. going around that he might be. But just for the right, I don't think he's actually on yet. What do you think? I mean, the one devil's advocate that I can say is that it, the DC universe, yes, it's very dark and it feels more realistic and gritty. You are going to need some sort of levity in there eventually. You can't just have nine superheroes hang out of the Justice League all being really solemn and grim and. Batman and Superman are like, hey, sorry, we got in a fight that one time. Like, you're <laughs> going to need somebody to put some sort of white source in there. Ryan Reynolds would have been a great candidate for that. Mm, yep. Having said that, when I saw him as Deadpool at Comic-Con in Hall H, I was like, this is the guy This is the guy to play this role. There's a thousand dudes that could be, or women, Sinead, that could be the Green Lantern, that, that could right. carry on that mantle. There's not that many that could be Deadpool. And the fact that he gets to redeem what they did to Deadpool in Wolverine Origins just feels right. You know, I, I kind of wish that Taylor Kitsch got the same shot and he could come back yeah. as Gambit, but yeah. hey, we're not so lucky. Ryan Reynolds should be playing Deadpool. He was fine as Green Lantern, in my opinion. He's Deadpool. Uh, by the way, if you have not seen three Ryan Reynolds films you should see and you probably haven't seen uh, if you've not. One, definitely, maybe. I thought that's actually one of his best performances he ever done. Mm -hmm. Buried, which is a whole movie that is just him in a box buried six feet underground. That's the whole movie start to finish. And if you want to know how good of an actor Ryan Reynolds is, watch that movie. But my favorite comedy Ryan Reynolds has ever done is still probably to this day Just Friends with Amy Smart. Yeah. Yeah. It's, such, it's such a like a surfacey hollow movie, but so funny and so engaged. I, I just love that film. So check those ones out. All right, what's next? Berinder Pal writes, Hey guys, I'm just wondering, why would studios open four big films on the same weekend? We're talking about June 10th, 2016. The films include The Conjuring 2, The Enfield Poltergeist, Now You See Me, The Second Act, Uncharted, and Warcraft. Do you think they will release all of these films on this day, or are some of them going to move? If yes, who will move their release date? Yeah, I think one of them is going to move. Uh, now, there's a couple. There's an interesting dynamic going on here in that you have a bunch of different movies that are going to be targeting very different demographics. So you've got uh, The Conjuring 2, which is going to be targeting your horror audience. you got the Now You See Me thing, which is a totally different audience from that. But then you run into two that are going to have a problem with each other. And then you're running into Uncharted, and you've got, and you're running into Warcraft, and those two are going to be trying to draw from the same pool. Mm -hmm. One of those has to move. That just one of them has to move. I think the other two are fine, and I think it's going to be the film that we really don't know anything about yet, and doesn't seem to have much movement right. going on, which is Uncharted. I mean, that film is, as far as I know, it's sputtering. It's not the development isn't happening. And even if Warcraft wasn't on this date, I do not see this movie making that 2016 release date. I think in the earliest we're going to see this movie is 2017. So yeah, one will move, and I don't think it's going to be Warcraft. Shep, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. I mean, we don't even, who's who's in Uncharted? We don't know yet. Yeah, it's like, A bunch I mean, of emojis at this point. Yeah, it's probably, yeah, some Minecrafting yeah. is happening. Chris Pine. <laughs> yeah, Chris Pine and Ryan Reynolds. Chris Pine, emojis <laughs> and Minecraft. Fighting each other, or Uncharted 2, they're just putting the sequel out first. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, they're, that's definitely going to move. The other two are definitely good counter programming for the day of Warcraft. So I definitely see that. And that's what it's going to be is the day of Warcraft. Look, I love The Conjuring. I'm excited about the sequel. Now You See Me was a fun little movie that I didn't think needed a sequel, but I think that some people might enjoy that in the theater. Warcraft has so much going for it right now. Even though I wasn't completely blown away by the footage I saw at Comic Con, this movie is poised to be one of the big tent pulls for this summer. So, Uncharted, God love you. I think you're going to be a great movie once you get, you know, 
people to be in it, but it's not going <laughs> to happen June 10th, 2016. That's the one that's going to get off that docket because two video game movies going against each other and Warcraft, Uncharted has a huge fan base. A lot of people oh, love sure. playing yes, Uncharted, yes. but Warcraft is like a cult. Like mm. people need all things Warcraft. Uh, the only thing that would that would sink Warcraft is if players of Warcraft can't get away from their computers for three hours <laughs> to go out and see the movie, and then come back and start playing it again. That's going to be one of the biggest movies of the entire summer, and I think it's going to own that weekend. A loaf of bread, a jar of peanut butter, and a two-liter bottle of Coke. Most important. John Campy is playing uh, <laughs> that's ritual. All for that's like, all I'm going to say. How many years did you do too, that? Too many years. I don't even want to think about how many years. Are. All right, folks, that'll do it for us for this installment of Collider Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. Listen, don't forget. Lots of great films playing at AMC Theaters right now. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for all of your theater, showtime, and, of course, your movie ticket information. If you want to stay up to date on everything going on in the world of movie news, minute by minute, make sure you subscribe to Collider.com. Keep your eye on that website there. The crack team of writers over there always keeping you up to date with all the insight of what's going on in the world of movie news. I want to thank, first of all, the people sitting at the table with me. Sitting over here to my left, Mr. John Schnepp. Schnepp, where can people find you online? You guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram at John Schnepp and at TDOSLWH. You can get my film, The Death of Superman Lives, What Happened. Documentary is available, digital download, Blu-ray, DVD. Go to the, the website, www.tdoslwh.com. Thanks. And sitting over here, comedian Mr. Mark Ellis. Mark, where can people find you? On Twitter and Instagram, at 5150ellis. And I just posted all my fall tour dates doing stand-up at markellislive.com. First up, Kansas City, Syracuse, and Atlanta. Let's party. He actually never leaves his apartment. <laughs> no, uh, and of course, our lovely host today, Miss Sinead DeFries. Sinead, where can people find you? I'm on all social media, including Twitter and Instagram, at Sinead DeFries, and at thatsosinead.com. And you can follow me just on all the various social media networks, just at John Campia. That'll do it for us, guys, for Collider Movie Talk. My name's John Campia. For, and until next time, <laughs> I was about to introduce somebody, but I decided not to. I'm Mark Ellis. Oh, bye. <laughs> <laughs>